it's uh, genuinely fantastic to be here. It's Friday morning, so I must be in Brisbane, right? Um, um, it's um, a, 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 just a sheer privilege to be with you today. Um, I'm just going to fire up this, so stay with me and finish your breakfasts. Hopefully this is all going to work marvellously well. Um, so I'm Peter, um, and uh, I've kind of been a bit of a fraud. You know, there's this huge expectation you get when you drag over 100 people out at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I just hope I meet your expectations. Because um, I guess I'm just like you. I'm actually a relatively ordinary person. Um, I am the same person that was flashing up on that PowerPoint earlier on, but with a beard. Having seen that kind of younger self, that picture from 10 years ago, I, I feel motivated this evening to go back to the hotel and shave. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the entire CV. Uh, I'm glad you didn't also quit on my school reports. So, so it's what I can also kind of say. So I uh, came to Social Enterprise through a bit of a strange route. Uh, I started work uh, at Marks and Spencers, which is a department store, uh, so as a retailer. Uh, I, I wanted to do something that, that met my values as an individual, as a person, really. And so I moved and ended up working for Body Shop International. And it didn't take me long to realise that Satsuma flavoured bubble bar wasn't actually going to change the world. Um, so I ended up working for Ross Family, Greenpeace, and a whole variety of other organisations and charities. And actually, I found the experience at times quite frustrating. I found charities to be sometimes bureaucratic, uh, doing to people, not doing with people. Uh, I found that charities were sometimes risk averse. And in some cases, it could take two years to get a decision made. Uh, and I'm not saying that all charities operate like that, but I can see from smiles, particularly you, sir, the glasses <laughs> on the table there, this is ringing true with some of you. And I, it always frustrated me, why can't we bring the best of business to social change, the, the dynamism, the entrepreneurial spirit to changing our communities? Uh, why do we have, always have to be kind of largesse and, and slow to respond within the traditional charity sector? Um, so, I decided to go and set up my own organisation and I set up somewhere in 2000 and tried to, to merge the two ideas together. And we had some relative success, but that, the success that we had wasn't my success. The success we had was made by empowering our service users, our people, our staff, our community to be the agents for change themselves. Uh, every kind of movement needs a leader and I kind of fell into that role. Uh, but what I sought to do in that role was create a whole network of other leaders not followers. And so I came to social enterprise, and the more I did it, the more change and the more potential I saw emerge within people's lives. It was phenomenal. And it convinced me that social enterprise has much to offer. I've now been in my role at Social Enterprise UK uh, for uh, three and a half years now, uh, and I've been privileged to see just how dynamic the social enterprise sector is becoming right around the world. And you know, there's a, a constant theme that's uh, emerged inside the uh, I've been over here in Australia, and that is, we've got so much to learn. And actually, I'm here to tell you today that you don't. You are well on the way to developing a fantastic movement. I've met some incredible individuals, some, some heard some stories about social change, about social entrepreneurship, that convinces me that social enterprise and social entrepreneurship is alive and well and thriving here in Australia. You can learn from each other and learn from yourselves, and we can learn from you as much as you can learn from us. So anyway, on with the show. Uh, I've got uh, somewhere in the region of about 96 slides to get to. Rather optimistic in 25 minutes, but I will do my best. So first of all, I'm going to depress you uh, and tell you why that actually the time is right for social enterprise. Not just in the way that we deliver public services, uh, but just you know, in terms of almost every part of, of the economy and the world. So the Earth, 4.5 billion years old. Uh, uh, what is social enterprise? Uh, well, it's kind of cut off there. I hope that's not the, 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 the sign of things to come. But that says a business trading for a permanent and primary social and environmental purpose. It's as simple as that. We don't need to get caught up in pages and pages of definitions. We don't need to introduce what sorts of legal models are necessary. They are simply businesses, and they simply trade primarily for a social purpose. That means they are selling goods and services. Most uh, social enterprises aren't in the game of, you know, kind of rattling the collection tin. They are finding things to sell, whether that's services or goods, uh, as a way of creating the change they want to create in their communities. Just a couple of brief examples from the UK. We've got HCT Group, 
Uh, this started out as a community transport provider. You know, minibuses. I've been to a couple of minibuses, two or three minibuses in East London, ferrying disabled people around uh, who couldn't find traditional forms of public transport accessible. Uh, from, from small uh, origins, under the leadership of a fantastic social entrepreneur, Di Powell, who's on my board of directors, ATT Group have grown into a thriving London bus company. And from London they have developed and run bus services in Hull, which is in the north of England, in Bristol, in the south west of England. They now, have, they now have a fleet of about 90 buses, uh, and they deliver commercial services. And why do they deliver commercial services? Well, why should they be confined only to delivering services to disabled people? They can create much more change by actually seeing themselves as a business that's driven by a social mission. So this bus company operates in the following way. They recognise that lots and lots of people in East London, particularly from ethnic minorities and particularly women, have problems in terms of getting into good quality jobs. So they actively go out and recruit these people as bus drivers, because bus drivers in England uh, actually get relatively high salaries, 25, 30,000 pounds a year, 50,000 dollars is not a bad salary if you were previously unemployed. Uh, they also put new bus services based on the profits they generate from running traditional mainstream buses uh, to meet the needs of uh, kind of isolated and elderly and disabled communities uh, where the government contracts and funding to deliver those services to be cut back. So by growing up a fully commercial business, they're raising their own money to deliver the services that they were originally conceived to and created to deliver. And of course, uh, it's great to be here with Bank uh, who I now understand is a social enterprise itself, uh, which is a cooperative. Here in the UK, the whole movement was born 150 years ago by the Rochdale Pioneers. The Rochdale Pioneers were fed up of being exploited when they tried to buy food from private merchants, and so they set up a cooperative back in the 1850s uh, as a way of, of, of kind of spreading food at low cost around their community. The Co-op Bank and the Co-op Group now in the United Kingdom, 123,000 staff, 17 billion pounds turnover. We need to be ambitious. If we're going to meet the needs of our society and our communities, a bit of ambition and a bit of aspiration certainly won't go amiss. So why is social enterprise now more important than ever? Just a few things uh, from me. Prediction is very difficult uh, to, to, to make, uh, particularly about the future. So it's hard to necessarily understand what's exactly going on. But this is the last kind of 50 years of, of life across the world. This is called the Great Acceleration. Uh, um, I, I'm looking across the room, and most of you weren't born around this period, I'm guessing, unless uh, life in Brisbane keeps you looking as young as you clearly are. Uh, but basically, we have seen this massive change in the world over the last 50 years. We've got foreign investment increasing from almost zero back in 1950, right up the top. Species extinction, population, GDP, Vast, vast change happening at an incredible pace. Uh, human demand massively beginning to outstrip uh, the Earth's resources. Water scarcity, food scarcity, soil degradation. We've got land grabs going on where developing countries are seeking uh, to take land. I think you'll see Australia featured there, uh, land being bought up at an alarming rate from the likes of China. Uh, trying to secure their own population's needs by buying land up in, in, in foreign areas. You've got the world population growing massively, uh, and it gets worse. You'll be delighted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Life expectancy uh, kind of increasing at a, a, a ridiculous rate. So not only have you got this massive increase in the world's population, 20% at least in the next 30 years, but everyone's living up for, for longer. And that puts huge strains on all of our care services and social services. Uh, it puts huge strains on our communities. Uh, and everyone's moving into cities. So kind of the cities are becoming uh, kind of uh, larger and larger and larger, uh, right across the world. And our view of cities that we maybe had 30 or 40 years ago, which might have been based on Star Trek, actually aren't real. This is what the kind of future city is probably going to look more like, as global inequality rises at a huge and significant pace. And of course, you know this more than anyone because you, know, you guys are perhaps the most uh, advanced in terms of your thinking around the environment. But uh, in the year 2000, um, the, uh, kind of the, the, a group of different countries got together. Uh, so this is an intergovernmental agency and, and started to plot predictions on CO2 emissions. And this was their kind of uh, optimistic vision that we might get here. 
Uh, this is their worst case scenario. And as you can see, only 13 years on from when they made these predictions, we're pretty close to being just as bad as they thought it might be. Uh, you, you will see a dip here. Does anyone know what that dip is? GMC. That's the global economic crisis, uh, as you call it. Uh, and uh, as you'll see, the global economic crisis uh, managed to pull down uh, CO2 emissions. Actually, we need a global economic crisis twice as big as it was in order to get back to their best, their best kind of hope for CO2 emissions. So things are very, very challenging out there, uh, locally in our communities and nationally. We're missing the 2% uh, kind of uh, uh, best guess for protecting uh, the quality of our life. Now it looks like we're going to be close to a 4 degree increase in global temperatures, creating unprecedented change. And I don't want to scare you at breakfast. Uh, the sun is shining outside, but at 4 degrees, you, know, you are looking at massive declines in agricultural yields, sea level rises around the world, uh, species extinction, forest fires, droughts, flooding, heat waves. It's a brave man that stays in Brisbane, I imagine. <laughs> um, increasing risk of dangerous feedbacks and abrupt large scale shift in the climate system. The future is looking very, very uncertain. And you will know that you know, we are seeing uh, every, every year a greater range of natural disasters occurring. Uh, the, the tornadoes in the States, the most recent, in what seemingly is just an increasingly kind of recurrent and, 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 and frequent uh, a range of natural disasters that, that, that continually hit right around the world. Uh, I thought I'd share this with you because this is kind of quite interesting. Because we've talked about, and you can't even see it, so I know you can't see it, so I'll make it a bit easier for you. What we've got here is six severe income disparity, fiscal imbalances, water supply crisis, mismanagement of a population that's ageing, uh, rising uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This is the World Economic Forum that meets in Davos each year, Davos each year, uh, predicting what are they, the most significant risks facing humanity and the planet. And right up there, you've got the mismanagement of a population that's ageing, you've got income inequality in effect. So the growth in income inequality across the world is really, really significant. And these challenges uh, are being plotted, but actually very little is being done about them. But I'm soon going to turn uh, back to my optimistic self. But before I do, uh, I'm just going to, to paint an even bleaker picture. Uh, this is what's happened uh, to kind of prosperity uh, since the 1970s. Uh, the top 1% have basically grabbed all of the extra wealth that's been created. Uh, the top 1% have become extraordinarily rich. These are now the super rich people in the world that are very, very mobile. They, they have private jets and they, they flit around tax havens, uh, largessing in their money. Uh, but for most people, um, you know, life has improved, but, but not proportionately to, to the wealth that has been generated across the world. Um, and as millionaires have got richer and richer and richer, the tax rate for millionaires have become less and less and less. So back in uh, the 1970s, uh, the average tax rate for a millionaire with all of their tax avoidance schemes was still around 30% today, it's 22%, and we've got, now got global uh, kind of unemployment rising uh, around the world. In Greece and in Spain and in Portugal, uh, who are all of a sudden getting very, very excited about social enterprise, 58% youth unemployment. Absolutely kind of shocking what that does to communities. Um, so it's a bleak picture. Um, what you'll also see is that businesses, by their very nature, unless you're a cooperative or a social enterprise, um, are becoming more and more short term. So back in the 1960s, the average share or stock would have been held for eight years. As of 1997, it was eight months. Any idea where we, where we might be today? We're down to four months. So we've gone from eight years to four months. What that does is drive incredibly short-term behaviours by very, very large businesses. Because what they are constantly focused on is pleasing their shareholders and meeting their shareholders' expectations, which means that there is a need to constantly deliver higher and higher profits. And it's kind of a culture now of profit at any cost. We're not looking necessarily at, uh, towards the long term, as we absolutely need to be, given the challenges that we're, that we're now facing. And trust in institutions as a consequence is at an all-time low. Uh, so what you see here is uh, global companies, national companies, uh, you see businesses in general uh, losing and eroding trust with the ordinary folk like you and me. Um, and then only to be less trusted is of course our politicians. No surprise there. Any politicians in the room? No, they're later, I won't mention that. Uh, okay. Does anyone, anyone just out of interest, anyone think who might have more trust than NGOs? 
who might be at the, the highest level of trust in our, in our society right now? The religious institutions? Oh, no, the religious sorry. institutions are here and they are uh, kind of trusted. And this was before um, the, 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 the child abuse scandals rocked the Catholic Church. They may have plummeted a few points on, on my little table, uh, subsequently. No, at the top, which is really interesting, I think, peculiar, as it may seem, the armed forces. We trust our armies more than we trust our charities. <laughs> we certainly trust them more than we trust our, our big companies and our, and, our, and our parliamentary systems. And of course, this mistrust in business is driving a sense of uh, uncertainty and anger right around the world. And you'll be familiar with the kind of the, the Occupy movements. You know, sorry for the inconvenience. We're trying to change the world. People over profit, this anger that has uh, kind of captivated large parts of the world. Uh, and of course, in the UK, a top a hot topic right now is tax avoidance of the very, very big businesses, and you might be aware of that. But kind of Starbucks uh, make no profit in, in Britain. Not a single penny, honestly, you uh, Yes, we've increased our number of coffee shops from 12 to 756, but honestly, there's no money in coffee. Uh, actually, uh, they've shifted all of their profits back to Luxembourg, where corporation tax is, is tight. So even if, you've, even if you've avoided a recession, as you know, lucky Australians have, um, Governments are still being constrained for, for, other, for other reasons. And, and tax across the entire Western world is being contracted as businesses are becoming much more agile and deciding simply not to pay tax. And across the UK, uh, you know, we have uh, kind of an understanding that Google and Amazon, Starbucks, these huge companies that are trading at billions of pounds simply are not making any profit and can't contribute to uh, the, the, the government's services, public services. And what does that mean? That means Less schools, less money for roads, less money for adult social care, for children's services. That's the harsh reality of this kind of globalised world in which we live. And you know what? I, you can't really blame them. You cannot blame Starbucks or Amazon or Google or, or Apple or whoever it might be from, from trying to legitimately not pay tax. Because the way that old businesses have been developed it, it is they have been given a mandate and their licence to operate is to put their shareholders first and foremost. Not communities, not their staff, their shareholders and their owners. They have a fiduciary responsibility to maximise the value of their shareholders. So they're not doing anything other than what they were designed to do. And, and they're not human beings. You can't rationalise with them. And so we shouldn't necessarily expect them to operate in any different kind of way. That's just a picture of the Queen, but I quite like. And so we're trying to create a kind of a global response to this, and we've got the G8, the G20, and the United Nations going, we need a global response. But when was the last time that the world, all like, you know, 178 countries, could agree on anything? So the idea that there was going to be a global response, and all of a sudden we're going to be able to fund our, our services through uh, a unified approach to tax, is probably not going to happen within the next five to ten years. If I was a betting man, I would say it's unlikely to happen in the next you know, couple of decades. So we need a response that isn't driven by government. So, what can solve these interrelated, vast, seemingly impossible challenges? Now, do you know what I'm not going to say at this point? I'm the man from Social Enterprise UK. Okay. Uh, I am an optimist, uh, and I do believe uh, that there are uh, uh, reasons to be cheerful amongst this kind of bleak, uh, and, and worrying environment in which we live. And I believe this is the time for social entrepreneurs to, to, to really begin to step up and make a difference. And we're beginning to see it. So this is Cressy, uh, a fantastic social entrepreneur. And she uh, lives in England, and she's my friend. And she cares passionately about the environment. And she's a very, very canny businesswoman. And so what Cressy did is realise that all this kind of stuff, do you know what this stuff is? Fire hoses. So these items are old fire hoses used by the London Fire Service to fight fires. In illustrious 30 years of fighting fires, what happens to them once they've served uh, their, their lives out? They just get landfilled. And she saw the quality of this product and this, this stuff and decided she could do something phenomenal with them. And she has turned them into handbags and bags and all sorts of stuff. Uh, her manufacturing process uh, involves disadvantaged young people, homeless people, <coughs> working in factories, stitching them together, it's a very, very successful brand. This is stocked in Harrods. I'm wearing the cufflinks. Uh, very, very powerful. Uh, you can take a closer look uh, afterwards. But this incredible stuff is now owned by Cameron Diaz. Uh, this is expensive, high worth stuff. People love it because it's not only a really, really high quality cool handbag, belt, cufflinks, wallet. 
Uh, it's also got a fantastic story behind it. It's stopped in Harrods. Cameron Diaz has a handbag. Uh, I've got the belt and the wallets and the couple links. I really believe in social enterprise, uh, let me tell you. And we're seeing um, others. This is Panther Poverty, a uh, social enterprise set up by Ben Ramsden, a young social entrepreneur that said, you know what? The way that we source our clothing, you know, the whole principle of buying cheap and manufacturing in Bangladesh, basically it sucks. So I'm going to reinvent a carbon neutral, fair trade approach to pants. Now, in the same way that I've got the cufflinks and the wallet and the belt, I've got the pants, but I'm not going to share uh, the reveal with you uh, just yet. It's too early, maybe after breakfast. Um, and we're seeing people like Lauren set up a whole forestry business called Thinking Flowers, which is redefining the, the forestry industry, which is incredibly environmentally degrading. And so we're seeing the rise of the social entrepreneur. And this is Karen Lynch. Karen used to work for Barclays. Boo, Barclays, they're not here, it's okay, please don't tweet it. We'd like you Barclays because occasionally you give us some money. But Karen left Barclays uh, and set up Belly Water. And Belly Water's proposition is very, very simple. Don't drink bottled water. Drink tap water, but if you must drink bottled water, because you're not near a tap, uh, then drink belly water. And you know what? We're a carbon neutral company. We will never export beyond the shores of England, because that would be environmentally uh, very challenging. And you know what? All of the money we generate from the sale of bottled water, we're going to give away. And we're going to give it to clean water projects overseas. And so we're seeing more and more people, individuals, say, you know what? I'm not helpless in this world that's looking bleak and it's looking concerning. There are ways to respond to the challenges in our communities, uh, that our country faces, and you know what? I can't expect government to do it, I'm gonna do it myself. Now we've been fortunate in the UK, and we've, we've, we've been collecting data on what's happening across the social enterprise movement here in, here in England, and the United Kingdom. So 40% of all social enterprises are based in areas of wealth deprivation. That's a great statistic, you know? The more complex, the more challenging the community, the more likely you are to find a social enterprise operating there. Um, but they're much more prevalent in areas of deprivation and need than traditional businesses. 58% um, grew last year compared to only 30% of SMEs. So they're outperforming the private sector. There is something happening, they're resonating with people. People are getting this model that people, planet, and profit can work together to change our communities. Trading can be reinvented and redefined in a way that benefits society. That's my 10 minute call. Gosh, and I'm only on slide 57. <laughs> I knew it was optimistic. So what we're also seeing is traditional businesses also move towards social enterprise. Thank you for timekeeping, that's really helpful. This is a fire station, an old fire station, nothing to do with the, the belts and the wallets, but has been developed by PricewaterhouseCoopers with Social Enterprise UK. It's a social enterprise hub, and it's in you know kind of prime real estate in between London Bridge and Tower Bridge in London. And this is PwC, they're a bunch of accountants. Um, and they are now involved in running this, a fabulous restaurant that takes homeless people off the street uh, mm. and trains them up as chefs over a period of 12 months and gives them jobs and accommodation and an opportunity to get back into life. There is an opportunity, private businesses is kind of getting on board with some of this now. Um, and if you're ever in London, um, my office is actually on the third floor and I'd be delighted to take you out for lunch. Uh, the offer only is open for the next uh, week. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's Brigade, uh, and we're seeing more and more of this. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Coca-Cola, although I do sometimes drink it, but what's happening here is an, an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur, recognised that whenever they went in the developing world, you'd always find bloody Coca-Cola. You know, you wouldn't find medicine, sanitary, clean water, but you'd always find Coca-Cola. So how can we use the power of traditional business to, to benefit our communities? And the answer here was taking hydration packs and medicine and designing them in such a way that they can ride on the back of coke crates. So as coke is being taken to the farthest and most isolated parts of Africa, the medicines can travel with them. And that's the way of getting medicine out to parts of the community. Now these rehydration kits have saved somewhere in the region of 800,000 lives since the social entrepreneur invented them and did a deal with coke. And coke is now, its eyes have been opened. This is not all that coke is doing around social enterprise. Uh, it now has social enterprise procurement strategies. It wants to buy from social enterprises. And slowly but surely, we are beginning, the social entrepreneurs of the world are beginning to change behaviours uh, across the private sector and across cons consumption habits and across every part of the world. This is uh, a joint venture done by Mohamed Yunus, uh, in the Nobel laureate from Grameen, with Danone, the yogurt company. 
And basically what they recognized was that malnutrition was killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of children across the developing world. They developed with the known, the yoga people, a yogurt that has 12 key nutrients in that will keep children alive. And so Danone invested in the, in the yogurt factory. Uh, the yogurts are sold at very, very low cost, but with a margin, so that the profits can go back and pay Danone for their original investment in creating the factory. And so that the whole business can expand further and further across the world, making sure that the cheap yogurt cup is available as far and as wide as possible, tackling malnutrition in a, in a highly innovative way. And we're now seeing leading chief execs of lots and lots of private businesses kind of you know, understand that they have a bigger role simply than just make profits for their shareholders. Diageo uh, is a drinks company, uh, very, very large, uh, selling internationally, uh, and they're recognizing that in, in order to keep their staff engaged and their customers on board and loyal, they have to see, be seen to be adapting to these kinds of challenges. And this is Paul Pullman from Unilever, one of the largest kind of grocery uh, firms in the world. Any business that does internalize these external challenges, both social and environmental, will be rejected by its customers. So there is a revolution, there is an appetite. So even if you don't feel comfortable about this brave new world of social enterprise, there are people out there that are used to doing business that can help you get your enterprise off the ground or help take your charity or your service down a more entrepreneurial route. No one's expecting you to become a Richard Branson overnight. Um, but there, are, there is a new kind of sense of, of shared value and, and, and shared need to respond to the sorts of challenges that we're experiencing. And, and what's really fascinating about Paul Coleman, before I show you the share price, is that he has kicked out the hedge funds, he has ceased to publish quarterly financial reports to his shareholders. He said, I'm on a bigger mission, this is about, I want long-term investors, you know, people that are here to make a quick buck, I'm not interested in having this part of this company. And since he did that, share price has doubled. Now, public sector services, uh, and this is an area that I'm guessing is, is going to be really, really relevant to you guys. Um, what we recognised at Social Enterprise UK, in the 1980s, lots and lots of our public services during the last recession just said, government can't pay for them, we're just going to privatise the lot. And they all privatised the private sector, and that created very, very perverse consequences in many, many cases. Because the profit motive and public service don't always sit well next, next to each other. Uh, and so we've seen the degradation of children's services. Uh, we've seen people that are underqualified on really low rates of pay being given the responsibility to look after our most vulnerable children. And that has created some appalling media stories uh, about very, very high levels of, of uh, young people being abused in, in homes where they're not well and appropriately cared for. There's been some very, very major issues. So at a time when government is saying we can't afford to run services, uh, and at a time when we all recognise that the private sector isn't always the best place to deliver public services, uh, where they have uh, this kind of conflict between profit and and service, what, what can be in the middle? Now in the NHS, uh, you know, our National Health Service is the closest thing that we've got in the UK to a Pope. Everyone cares passionately about the health service in, in England, and it's a very, very contentious issue. It needs reform, we can't afford it. So we have been working across all political parties to think through what solutions might emerge. So at the last uh, election, we had the Conservative Party manifesto, the Lib Dems, the Labour Party, and the Green Party all recognise the need for reform, but trying to visualise a different form of, of public service that sat between privatisation and the government trying to run everything. Um, I'm going to come back to that slide because that's kind of some of the politics. My point is, is that you're having exactly the same argument now in this country about how you reform public services and making them fit for, for the future. Uh, what we've been doing is, uh, and I'm part of the Mutual Task Force, is, is trying to encourage staff uh, that are currently employed by the state to break away from the state and form their own businesses, but form their own social businesses, to become social entrepreneurs and to establish themselves as social enterprises. We in the UK have six million people employed by the state. The vision is that at least one million of those people will move into the social enterprise space. The social enterprise space in the UK currently already employs one million people. So we're looking at doubling the size of our sector uh, based on uh, uh, healthy people that were employed by government to set up social enterprises. And we've seen some outstanding successes. When you give your staff, your people, whether you're a charity, a service provider or anyone else, the opportunity to be entrepreneurial, you know, people, people, people like a spark in their, in their tummies, 
and they get excited and they start thinking and imagining the unimaginable. And they redefine services. They build relationships with service users. Uh, they start finding their inner entrepreneurial selves and they radically overhaul services for the better. And not only are they cheaper, they are better quality. They're more involving of the people. They, they need more effectively. This is a group of nurses, Central Surrey Health. Um, they, their turnover of their budget is, is, you know, they went from being nurses to being social entrepreneurs almost overnight. They've been running their business now for 25 years. Uh, no, not 25 years. Their turnover is currently £25 million. And they've been running their business since about 2006, 2000, uh, 2007. And they've been making an incredible saving on the running of the service and yet an increase in patient satisfaction uh, and quality of delivery. Uh, and employee engagement, you know, it's, this isn't about top-down social entrepreneurs dictating to staff teams, this is where it's going to be. This is about participation, cooperation, co-production. This is about working together through the challenges we face. Because we can't just bury our heads in the sand and say, it's not going to happen here, we're not going to let it happen here, because it's happening right across the world. So responding to the changes in government spending is a necessity, it's not an option. And responding to that in a positive way, and thinking about it now, and looking at the entrepreneurial opportunities, thinking about how you can, like the bus company, expand into markets, sell stuff that you've never sold before, without degrading your service and protecting your social mission and your belief in public service, is a challenge, but it's a journey, and it's, a, it's an incredible journey to go on. Uh, we've been trying to shape stuff in the UK in a slightly different way. We now have the Public Services Social Value Act. And I'll be in Canberra talking to your government and your opposition uh, about what the Social Value Act means for commissioning public services. What this means is, is that anybody delivering, anyone spending public money uh, has to now take into account in England and, and Wales, not in Scotland, uh, they have to take into account social value. So this means I'm delivering uh, a catering uh, contract for uh, a local council. It's not just the price of the quality of the food that I'm delivering that's now taken into consideration. It's the number of people with disabilities that I'm employing. It's the number of young apprenticeships I'm offering. It's the, uh, the local sourcing of food, so the carbon. It's the transportation of that food. It's whether the food is delivered in biodegradable packaging, sustainable packaging. It's how I'm contributing towards the bigger challenges that we collectively face and that I outlined at the beginning of this presentation. So this act is trying to change government as a customer so it buys intelligently, so it buys community prosperity along with the services uh, and the products that it needs to buy. Very briefly, um, there are opportunities emerging. This is the rise of the social investor. In the UK, we have big society capital. You're all familiar with big society, aren't you, I guess? You heard about big society in the UK? It's the biggest failure of the last few years. Um, the, the last government came in with this notion of uh, big society, small government. Um, we're going to ask everybody to do their bit so the government doesn't have to do its bit. And of course, that went down really, really well. Uh, it's like the idea of doing a 12-hour day at work. You, know, you do your breakfast in the morning, but on the way to your business breakfast, can you plant a few daffodils in your local park? On your way home from work, can you pop in and serve uh, an elderly neighbour a hot meal? And then can you do a couple of hours in the library checking out books? No one called libraries and librarians anymore. And then you're welcome to go back to your family and, and, and clean and, and cook for them. And of course, that didn't go down so well. Uh, but actually, some of the good bits that have emerged out of this society is looking at social investment. So we have now a £600 million loan fund taken from dormant bank accounts, uh, bank accounts that have been lying dormant for 40 years. I understand it's very different in Australia. The government snapples your money if you don't touch your bank account in only three years. Um, uh, in the UK, we take money from dormant bank accounts that have been touched 40 years, uh, and we apply that money as a soft loan fund for social ventures and social enterprises. So that gives you the investment. The money has to be paid back, but it allows communities to buy assets and other uh, items. We're launching the Social Stock Exchange. This uh, enables uh, charities and social enterprises to list on the stock exchange and not issue equity, because we don't have equity to sell. Um, but on the whole, it means that we can issue bonds. An investor, maybe my mum, might say, I've got a few hundred quid, Pete, you know, I'll give you that, and you can invest that in, in a local charity. I'll be able to cash in those bonds, get my money back, but rather than putting my money in a pension pot, which means I'm investing in Apple, um, I'm going to invest in my local community and in local social enterprises and charities. And we're seeing the rise of the social impact bond, and payment by results. So the more innovative and the more successful you are in delivering your public service, the higher rate you will be able to claim back from government. 
which introduces profit. So you're not just being paid to deliver a service, you're being paid to deliver an outcome. And the more successful you are at transforming people's lives and changing people's lives and communities, uh, the more we will give you. So based on your success, depends on the profit that you will generate. And this is kind of happening right across the world now. And then crowdfunding, communities coming together and rather than trying to raise money from you know, one or two philanthropic trusts, asking everybody, a whole community, to put in 100, 100, US, uh, 100 Australian dollars so that you can buy your library or community centre. And we're seeing uh, a revolution kind of take place. Charities are increasingly doing this. This is a children's charity called uh, uh, Catch 22, which is one of uh, the UK's largest uh, children's charities. It's now Auto 22. And it's a, a network of mechanical garages for cars. They train young people to be mechanics. Uh, you can take your car in, get your clutch repaired by a young person who's learning the skill, learning the trade, and all the profit goes to support children's activities. Now, given the option of going to a regular garage or going to Auto 22, where might you want to go? I think there's something beautiful about even when your clutch goes, however annoying that might be, about taking it to a business that's creating social benefit and social change. And this organisation has set up a maintenance company. It now works with 10,000 young people, training them up, skilling them up, doing ground maintenance, carpentry, plumbing, uh, outdoor repairs, a whole range of businesses, all driven by the need to look after young people that are finding it difficult to get jobs uh, in the difficult UK economy. And we're seeing more and more of these businesses spring up, start small, acorns are planted and oak trees arrive. Because as a local authority, or as a government, or as a housing association, if you're going to buy maintenance services, why wouldn't you buy it from an organisation committed to this sort of social change and applying its profit to community prosperity and regeneration? We see communities buy up assets all over the place, football clubs, libraries, community centres, in some places, islands, because we can no longer look, unfortunately, as it may be, to governments to do this stuff for us. We have to become social entrepreneurs and we have to start taking the power back from government and from business and finding our own ways to take control of our own community prosperity. So this is now 10,000 hours for their football club. The residents of Gia, one of the islands off of Scotland, bought their island back off their landlord uh, and have now seen their population grow. You've got pubs, post offices, wind farms, solar panels now all being taken into community ownership. Uh, and it's absolutely uh, breathing life and a sense of community cohesion back into, into our towns and cities. The one thing that we're trying to convey here is uh, we, we think that actually buying and selling uh, goods and services, selling goods and services is empowering for, for civil society organisations and for charities. It's nothing to be scared of. It's much nicer to be able to sell something and make some money than go and knocking on a door and asking for a handout. It's something very, very empowering. Uh, once you start telling people that they can buy socially responsibly, they can help change their communities. You know, if the price is good and the quality is good, why wouldn't you? This is kind of the new fair trade, the new organic, uh, in my mind. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm glad the video is missing. Um, <laughs> there's my Twitter handle. Uh, so do feel free to tweet me. Have a look at our website, because there's some really nice and easy publications. I've given you kind of a whistle-stop tour of what's happening uh, around uh, the UK at the moment. I hope it's kind of a wetted your appetite for social enterprise to help you understand what's beginning to emerge. It's not just happening in the UK, it's happening in China, it's happening in Russia, it's definitely happening in Australia. But to meet the challenges that I presented at the beginning, we really, really need to kind of become uh, much more ambitious in, 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 our, um, in our appetite for this kind of way of working. Thank you very much. <laughs>